let's go ahead and dive into the sea ice. What's the three most important things about sea ice, guys? Sea ice extent was the sixth lowest on the satellite record, which is 1979 to now. And the downward trend continues. And the last uh, 17th of September extents are the 17 lowest on the record. So, um, you know, sea ice is going down. The amount of multi-year ice was largely unchanged from 2022 as multi-year ice extent remained far lower than in the 80s. So it's the multi-year ice, which is the thing that we really pay attention to. Anything that is like more than two years is considered multi-year ice. Average sea ice thickness for the 2022 and 2023 winter was lower than in the previous winter. Near the 2011 to 23 average volume at the end of 2022 and 2023 winter was the same as the previous year. So there you go. Arctic sea ice is the frozen interface between the ocean and the atmosphere. It reduces absorption of solar energy because of its high albedo relative to the darker ocean surface. In addition, as a physical barrier, it modifies the heat and moisture transfer between the atmosphere and the ocean. Sea ice plays a key role in the ecosystem providing an essential habitat for marine life and modulating the biogeochemical balance of the Arctic. Mm -hmm. Sea ice cover has long played a practical and cultural role in the indigenous communities of the North. Sea ice historically limited national and corporate activities in the Arctic, but decreased ice cover is influencing commercial transportation, resource extraction, and national security. The winter of 2022-23 freeze up was typical of recent years with sea ice growth rates near average while releasing aerial coverage remained in the lowest 10% extent. Mm. Yeah. Ice growth was particularly slow in the Barents and Kara Seas as well as the Chukchi Sea, but near normal in other regions. Winter near surface air temperatures were higher than in 1991 and 2020 average over most of the Arctic Ocean, particularly in the Barents Sea and portions of the Beaufort Sea. Hmm. However, lower temperatures prevailed over much of the Eurasian side of the Arctic during spring. Summer temperatures were mixed with higher than average temperatures over the Barents, Kara, Beaufort, and Chukchi Seas, an average or slightly below average temperatures elsewhere. So let's talk about sea ice extent. One of the most commonly used indicators of long-term Arctic sea ice conditions is sea ice extent, which is defined as the total area covered by ice for at least of at least 15% concentration. The primary source of extent observations is the 45 year record starting in 1979, derived from satellite borne passive microwave sensors. This satellite record tracks long term trends, variability, seasonal changes from the annual extent maximum in late February or March, and the annual extent minimum in September. Extents in recent years are approximately 50% lower than values in the 1980s. 2023, March and September extents were lower than other recent years. And though not a new record low, they continue the long-term downward trends. March 2023 was marked by low sea ice extent around most of the perimeter of the sea ice edge with the exception of the East Greenland Sea, where the extent was near normal. At the beginning of the melt season, ice retreat was initially fairly slow through April. In May and June, retreat increased to a near average rate and then accelerated further through July and August. By mid-July, the ice had retreated from much of the Alaskan and Eastern Siberia coast and Hudson Bay had nearly melted out completely. In August, 
Sea ice retreat was particularly pronounced on the Pacific side, opening up vast areas of the Beaufort, Chukchi, and East Siberian seas. Summer extent remained closer to average on the Atlantic side and the Laptev, Kara, and Barents Sea. So this is particularly interesting. So you see this graphic here that we're looking at. This is the percent difference relative to 1991 to the 2020 average. And we're talking about March and September and the behaviors over time, looking at March and September. So if we look at black, March, you can see, yes, it's going on, it's going down, but it's particularly kind of like a little bit more steady. It's going down, but it's not steeply going down. However, in September, which is the red, you can see the declination points sharply downwards. And over time, it remains constant. And you can see at this point, we are under, we are 30% less sea ice than that average. And you can see the average being represented, I guess, by the zero line. So there you go. I mean, you can see the behavior. It's going down. It's going down fast. Let's take a look at the next graphic. And this is the March and September monthly averages. Let's see. This graphic here is the sea ice extent from 1991 to 2020. Yeah, look at it. Is the median. And so... You can see in March, again, there isn't really that much difference. The, difference. the, blue, the blue line is um, where it had been in that 30-year average. And then you can see where we are um, in this, yeah. this month. But it's not much difference. However, in September, this is where the big difference lies. And also this doesn't, this is an extent map and it doesn't really talk about the multi-year ice, but implied within here, not only is the extent going down, but the multi-year ice has vastly changed. And there is very, very, very little four-year multi-year ice left mm. in the Arctic. There's just a little skin over Greenland and that is about it. Um, let's take a look at the sea ice age. Let's go ahead and just go through this and we'll take a look at the graphic next. Tracking the motion of ice and passive microwave imagery using feature tracking algorithms can be used to infer sea ice age. Age is a proxy for sea ice thickness because multi-year ice generally grows thicker through successive winter periods. Multi-year ice has shown interannual oscillations, but no clear trend since 20, 2007, mm -hmm. reflecting variability in summer sea ice melt and export out of the Arctic. After a year when substantial multi-year ice is lost, a much larger area of first-year ice generally takes its place. Some of this first year ice can persist through the following summer, contributing to the replenishment of the multi-year ice extent. However, old ice, here defined as more than four years old, has re remained consistently low since 2012. Thus, unlike in earlier decades, multi-year ice does not remain in the Arctic for many years. At the end of the summer and 2023 melt season, multi-year ice extent was similar to 2022 values far below multi-year ice extents in the 1980s and 1990s. So this graphic here is so interesting. So the yellow, let's take a look. This is what the ice extent looked like in 1985 and the ice extent looked like oh my in 2023. That's and dramatic, Jennifer. Not only the extent, but pay attention to the yellow. The yellow is the multi-year ice. In 1985, I would say half the Arctic had ice in it more than four years. In 2023, however, this is the minimum. This is the Arctic minimum that we're showing here. You can see that there is practically no multi-year ice more than four years old. There's a little bit of a skin over the Canadian archipelago. I mean, and that's it. There's a little bit, 
Yeah, that's it, really. There's just a little swath that's kind of part of the gyre, the Mm -hmm. gyre. But the multi-year ice is gone. So it is deceptive if you only look at extent, but even the extent is really a lot lower than it used to be. So let's take a look at this next graphic, the extent of the multi-year ice in the Arctic. And this is the weak minimum total extent between 1985 and 2023. And what you can see here is that the multi-year ice, which is ice in this case, anything older than a year, is pretty much crashing. It crashed in 20, 2007. That was when the Arctic sea ice extent crashed in general. And the multi-year ice crashed at that time. And it's kind of, according to this state, a little bit steady in, let's see, any ice, um, so multi-year ice greater than one year is the black and the old ice greater than four years. That is the one that should just send sp- shivers along your spine because mm. it is gone. It is gone. G-O-N-E spells gone. Old ice more than it's four gone. years is effectively gone. There is no more. And that is your buffer because that old ice doesn't melt quite as easily. So let's uh, go ahead and keep diving on in. Mm -hmm. Sea ice thickness and volume. Estimates of sea ice thickness from satellite altimetry can be used to more directly track this important metric of sea ice conditions, although the data record is shorter for the extent and the ice age. Data from the ISIS SAT-2 and Cryo SAT-2 SMA satellite products tracking the seasonal October to April winter ice growth over the past four years show a mean thickness generally thinner than the 2021-2022 winter, but with seasonal growth typical of recent winters. April 2023 thickness from Cryosat 2 SMOS relative to the 2020, uh, 2011 to 2022 April mean shows that the eastern Beaufort Sea and the eastern Siberian Sea had relatively thinner ice than in 2011 to 2022 mean, particularly near the Canadian archipelago. That's exactly what we were just talking yep. about. Thickness was higher than average in much of the Laptev and Kara Sea, along with the west and northwest coast of Alaska, extending northward towards the pole. The East Greenland Sea had a mixture of thicker and thinner than average ice. So this is pretty interesting. You can see here, we're looking at the building of ice starting in October. So we're just at the minimum sea ice extent And these are satellite measurements, various types. You can kind of average them out. But what's important to note is the trend. And the trend um, over time is kind of, you know, that's the building of the ice. But very interesting, this next graphic of sea ice thickness and the sea ice thickness anomaly, Sandy. Pictures tell a thousand words. Sea ice thickness, which also coincidentally also maps the multi-year ice greater than four years or the older ice. You can see that there's a haze of sea ice thickness of yellowish just north of Greenland and north of the Canadian archipelago. Other than that, the sea ice thickness is, it's not there really. It's very, very thin. Um, As noted by the darker blue, the predominance of dark blue in the Hudson Sea is completely, you know, pretty much no thickness. And then the sea ice thickness anomaly, this is where you see how things have changed. You can see the Canadian archipelago has really changed. Remember when we looked at the 1985 graphic, there was considerable old ice in that same area. And that's noted by this um, sea ice thickness anomaly. So the orange is where the thickness has changed a lot since 1985. So Mm -hmm. let's continue to dive in, fellow nerds. It's a good dive. We're diving in the ice. It's a good dive. Let's dive into the sea ice. Yeah. Maybe. It won't hurt us. (laughs) 
Sea ice thickness estimates for moored instruments monitoring the sea ice continuously from below the ocean surface complement the satellite-derived products and give a unique insight on the long-term development of sea ice. Data from Norwegian Polar Institute looking um, upward-looking sonars installed in the Fram Strait in the early 1990s reveal that a regime shift of sea ice drifting out of the Arctic occurred in 2007. The region trans transitioned from thicker deformed ice to thinner, more uniform sea ice. This shift can be explained by more rapid export of ice from the Arctic Ocean. Sea ice thickness is integrated with ice concentration to provide winter volume estimates for cryosat 2 SMOS measurements time uh, measurement time period, seasonal change from winter maximum to summer, summer minimum and back show the strong seasonal cycle and interannual variability. There is little indication of, tre of a trend, though the relatively short 12 year time series. Volume gained in the 2022 and 2023 growth season of 12,900 uh, kilometers to cubed was within the range of earlier years in the record and balanced volume loss during the summer melt of 2022 melt season. So this next graphic is pretty interesting. This is the winter sea ice volume budget that was observed by, by Cryosat. Two, and you can see that mm, I would say it doesn't. I'm not really going to try and interpret this one because I don't see a clear trend. Um, to yeah. me, this looks kind of even. I don't see an up and down trend much in this volume, but this is the satellite, the mm -hmm. data that they got ever since 2011 on Cryosat 2. So let's go about talk about methods and data. Sea ice extent values are from the NSIDC sea ice index based on passive microwave derived sea ice concentration from NASA team algorithm. And um, though other quality products exist, sea ice age data. Sea ice age data are from the Ease Grid Sea Ice Age version four, in case you were wondering. <laughs> and quick, quick look Arctic Weekly Ease Grid Sea Ice version one. Good grief, how nerdy can they get? But archived are... at the NASA Snow and Ice <laughs> Distributed Active Archive Center at the Woo! National Snow and Ice Data Center, where in Colorado. Yay! They've got that where it lives. I said that in guys. the beginning, Jen. That's it's where it lives. either Alaska or Colorado. Alaska or Colorado. <laughs> yeah, that one. That that uh, National Snow and Ice Data Centers in Colorado. Yeah. In Lakewood, I believe. Um, the age is calculated via Lagrarian tracking of ice parcels using weekly sea ice motion vectors. Cool. Age is generally a proxy for thickness because older ice is typically thicker via therm thermodynamic growth and potentially dynamic thickening. Only the oldest category is preserved for each grid cell. Satellite altimetry has enabled the continuous retrieval of sea ice thickness and volume estimates over the entire Arctic basin during the freezing season, starting with ESA Cryosat 2 radar altimeter launched in 2010. Mm -hmm. This was followed in September 2018 by the launch of NASA's Ice Cloud. NASA Ice Cloud and Land Elevation 2 which is ISAT-2 laser altimeter. So you're getting a lot new, um, lot of new satellite technologies yes. up there. Thus, there are now two independent altimetry-based thickness and volume estimates. Weekly, Cryosat-2 estimates have been combined with thick, thin ice estimates from the ESA soil Moisture ocean salinity, which is SMOS. I was wondering what the SMOS algorithm means. It means soil moisture ocean salinity. 
okay, instrument launched in 2009 to obtain optimal estimate across the thin and thick ice regimes on a 25 kilometer resolution ease to grid. Optimal interpolation is used to fill the data in the weekly Cryosat 2 fields and to merge the Cryosat 2 and SMOS estimates. The results are from version 205, in case you were wondering. When combined with the sea ice concentration, the Cryosat 2 SMOS record of sea ice thickness is used to compute sea ice volume, and the data are available at this below link. ISAT2 thickness data used here are the gridded 25 kilometer to 25 kilometer monthly data originally presented in Petty et al. published in 2020. Mm -hmm. Now using version 5 ATL 10 free boards from the three strong beams of ISAT2 and V1. Point, I'm not kidding you, V1.1. <laughs> NES OSIM snow loading, which loads, which measures depth and density as described in Petty et al. 2023. And if you ever wonder why nobody really understands this stuff at the mass level, just try and digest that through your mind three times and go. see what happens to your brain. Well, yeah, <laughs> and that is, guys. that is the sea ice thickness. This is very nerdy stuff, but you know, net net guys, sea ice mm -hmm. is going down and there's no more old ice and the ocean's getting hot. That's what that means. And if you have children or grandchildren looking for a career, there's definitely a career in satellite work in science, in the STEMs, science, technology, environment. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So that was yeah, that was quite definitely. a lot. I was showing really quickly the maps and data while you were talking a little bit because this whole th Good. there's so much information in this report, and we we like diving. You know, we like taking deep dives, and a lot of you do. Yeah, a lot of you do. But there's snapshots. There's the data set gallery. There's the climate data primer tools and interactives global climate dashboard, which shows you can you can track things so you can track yeah. natural natural variability and climate change and you can look at okay so arctic sea ice since the start of the satellite era the extent of ice covering arctic ocean at the end of the summer has shrunk more than 40 percent now guys you know some of you might say well why is this important why is this important why is this important because Everything from the Arctic is affecting everything where we live, where you live, anywhere in the world. It's critically important. And when you talk to people and you talk about the Arctic, tell them how important the Arctic is, that people should understand it. Maybe we should stop funding wars, Jennifer, and start funding more Arctic research. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And also interfacing these research into concepts that are easily digestible to the common person, you know, because mm -hmm. it does take a while to get your head around it. And, you know, we've all been on this show looking at this stuff for years and years. And so it's sort of like drinking water for us, yeah. right? We've already built the infrastructure in our minds. A lot of people haven't. So there needs to be some sort of common interface.